thank you very much. Before I start, I, um, I was in here yesterday and I could, I was sitting in the back room and I couldn't read anything on some, quite a few, not everyone's on the presentations because the screen is quite small. So I changed my whole presentation this morning. So if there's weird things, I've tried to go through it, but if there's weird things, that's just because, yeah, I quickly changed the text to make it bigger. So I had to get rid of quite a bit of text as well. Um, but yeah, I'll be looking at both the role of hoarding within um, this transitional period between the Mesolithic and Neolithic um, in southern Scandinavia. And also, obviously, related to that, what hoarding can tell us about some of the social processes that might have um, gone on during very complex social processes. Um, so the main aim of this is to see not as hoarding as a simple byproduct of the Neolithic or the Neolithization, as is too often seen, um, rather to see it as an important kind of interaction context, uh, which may have actually helped shape um, um, some of the wider social processes that went along. Um, yes, yeah, so many of you may not be aware of the chronology of the Neolithic um, in Southern Scandinavia, and that's fair enough. So I'll quickly go through that, and then I'll go through um, some my kind of interpretive framework of why I think I can see hoarding, as well as other social practices, as important um, places that may have guided um, interaction and immigration and integration. And then I'll go through, hopefully very quickly, some of the material evidence of that, and then um, summing up the actual social role that we can see. Uh, so for those who don't know, the Mesolithic in southern Scandinavia began around 9000 BC and stretched to 4000 BC. That's obviously a Mesolithic hunter-gatherers. Uh, don't need to go into too much more detail than that for here. Um, but around 4500, 4400 BC, you get the earliest evidence of, uh, um, of contact with, um, with central European Neolithic communities. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any kind of actual immigration of these communities, but there's at least contact um, with either within southern Scandinavia or close by. And that's shown through, um, it looks like some sort of exchange goods, um, of in particular, nice axes, as well as other kind of um, bone rings and often quite fancy objects, um, and quite exotic objects. And then around 4000 BC, you've got the beginnings of what we're actual kind of immigration into southern Scandinavia, it looks like, uh, from Mikkelsberg communities, uh, which is northwest, cent um, central eastern Europe, um, that seem to actually come into southern Scandinavia. And based on the re recent DNA evidence, it looks like it's whole family communities that are migrating up into southern Scandinavia. Um, and quite quickly, uh, between 50 to 300 years after that, you appear to have a genetic replacement of the population. Um, but you do not have a cultural replacement, but there's a significant cultural change that does coincide with that. Um, but as I kind of alluded to, there are some important continuities between Mesolithic and Neolithic. So you don't have, although you may have genetic replacement, you do not have entire cultural replacement. So it's important to also look for continuities. Um, and yeah, these are some of the so settlement location, um, to an extent still reliance on wild foods, um, some continuities in lithic and pottery technology, I won't go into detail on those, as well as some of the depositional and kind of more kind of ritual, uh, monument, uh, not monumental, but ritual type practices do actually continue, but in different forms, they transform over the period. Um, and some, based on some recent DNA evidence, um, we've got these two quite confusing individuals. Um, one's called Lola, and she we've got no bones of. Uh, her DNA uh, was found in Birch Park Tar that she chewed um, and that has records her entire genome and also genome of presumably her last meals as well. Um, there's all manner of different ducks and quite interesting, quite a Mesolithic species. Um, and she dates to when the Neolithic should be in Denmark. Um, so around 3,900 to 3,700. Um, but her lifestyle um, is very Mesolithic and her genetic heritage is also Mesolithic. And generally at the site um, that she was found, um, it's quite an interesting site, but it's got more Mesolithic tendencies, um, I would say, at least in the depositional practices that occur there. Um, and then you've got quite an interesting drag zone man. Um, so he was found in a burial, can't remember, but 20 meters or something like that, away from two Mesolithic women that were buried together. Um, but he is buried. Um, with all manner of traditional kind of Neolithic goods, uh, pottery, kind of particular form of Neolithic axe. Um, but his Mesolithic is DNA and his isotopes, as far as I could, his isotopes, they were, I think, actually shown quite a Neolithic diet. So he, although he's Mesolithic in heritage, um, Neolithic in date, Neolithic in material culture, but that means 
that just, I think, starts to indicate you've got some quite interesting social processes that, uh, that we don't really completely understand yet. Um, th and that clearly some Mesolithic heritage was living. Uh, with, um, or people of Mesolithic heritage uh, were still living in southern Scandinavia in between 50 to four, almost 400 years after the transition. Um, but unfortunately, very, very wide radiocarbon dates. So it could be just Mesolithic or just into the Neolithic. Um, but they kind of confuse the picture a little bit. Um, so now I'll get on to some of my, my interpretive framework. Uh, many people don't always quite agree what a hoard is, and this kind of referred, uh, we we're discussing this a little bit um, in the kind of ritual depositional type session that was uh, yesterday. Um, so I thought I'd give my definition of a hoard. Um, it's not the most exciting thing, um, or exciting definition, but multiple objects deposited together. Um, and that, and those generally, I don't include material that includes waste type material. Um, and that includes kind of napping debris or food debris, um, also anything that contains human remains. I don't consider a hoard, but I'm welcome to know there's very blurred lines and problematic distinctions there. Um, and the, both the Mesolithic and especially the Neolithic hoards that I'll be looking at, they almost always, especially the Neolithic ones, contain single object or single material type um, and often complete objects. It is very different than just a, a pit full of um, napping debris or something like that. Uh, but I don't preclude the possibilities of a spectrum of practices with other forms of deposits. Um, and I try not to focus um, on my research uh, on just a single active deposit, but rather seeing these hordes are part of a much longer chain of practices that culminated in the depos deposition, but started potentially um, a long time before then. And practices are obviously not static beings um, or static entities. They change over time, and those changes can be kind of um, both through individual decision-making processes, um, but the general ritualized form of a practice is guided by and also structures the wider cultural environment around it. Um, it's not separate from it, it is a part of it. Um, and this is done through intentional use or not use um, of pre-existing notions, practices, concepts. Um, so therefore, some so any forms of changes or practices, um, they are potentially mediated through pre-existing wider societal structures. They don't happen in isolation. They happen as part of other potential changes happening in the environment. Um, and that can lead for continuities as well as changes um, to be potentially more um, conducive than others. And I really like um, one of the quotes from Luke Nilsson Stutz, uh, ritual variation at a certain point in, time, in some time, sorry, may constitute practices practices that ritual change can articulate with and thus be viewed as, as a continuation of traditional ways or at least a continuation of accepted variation. And throughout this presentation, I think one of the things that's really kind of guided um, some of the ways of thought is seeing hoarding practices as boundary objects, or I guess more specifically as boundary practice. Um, and that's important because so into the social processes underlying interaction, integration, um, all to really, I think, ultimately depend on the permeability and flexibility of cultural boundaries between kind of incoming and local communities. Um, and various things um, can act as kind of brokers between these communities can, that can help some of the integration type processes or can potentially hinder it as well. Um, and these boundary objects, um, they don't actually represent boundaries per se, um, but it's things that cross or help blur the boundaries between these different communities. Um, and this helps by, by recognizing these um, boundary objects and by potentially utilizing them, potentially even intentionally, that can help decrease perceived differences uh, between different communities, which promotes positive interaction. Um, and these represent points in which knowledge can be shared and exchanged um, and can, people can bond over. And sharing of knowledge, um, that's been shown to indicate openness between different communities. It helps create new communities from this type of sharing of knowledge and can help form new shared identities, um, as well as on a more kind of slightly practical level, but, um, new forms of ritualist practices that have been inspired by, um, in this case, kind of incoming and local communities. Um, and these boundary objects um, can represent kind of this episodic um, blurring of the boundaries 
Um, and this represents less of a massive disjuncture between interactive communities. Um, if you've got too much of this a massive juncture between different communities, you, it's more likely to cause strife in issues and not lead to any form of integration. Um, so boundary objects are very important in that. And this is just something I made or got inspired by this early this morning. Um, and so boundary objects, I think, can be ultimately seen as kind of points in which knowledge is shared. And when knowledge is shared, it um, involves a whole range of different social processes between different communities. Um, and this concept of boundary blurring, I don't believe has been used much in archaeology, it be used a lot in other disciplines. Um, and I think it would be very, um, I think very uh, useful to understanding how these communities change and the importance of objects, practices, um, and potentially people within these social processes. Um, I've also drawn on a wide variety of other disciplines from sociology, symbolic anthropology, and in particular, cognitive science of religion to try to understand the social and cognitive effects of practicing, witnessing, and sharing of knowledge, of hoarding behavior. Um, and in particular, um, the role that ritual practices can play at uh, modifying and negotiating cultural values uh, and identity, um, and therefore kind of assimilation, coexistence, or conflict between different groups um, can, can be really dependent on whether um, cultural values, especially involving ritual and potential also religion um, can or cannot be compromised. Um, and a huge wide range of really fascinating research from cognitive science of religion has looked at the importance of all the performance of ritual practices. And I have incredibly briefly summarized this complex form of research, but ultimately when you perform ritual practices, um, and this involves general, general social practices, but these processes are highlighted if you call it ritual. Um, so ritual practices increase, have been shown to increase social cohesion, solidarity, the increased based pro-social behavior. People are more likely to be nice to each other and give to each other if you perform rituals, especially together. Uh, collective identities are formed through ritual practices, um, especially ritual practices involve uh, communities coming together. Um, and ritual practices are very effective means of decreasing anxiety and risk of conflict, both kind of um, personal anxieties, but also um, community-wide anxieties. Um, so now I'll go through, hopefully very quickly, the archaeological evidence. Hoarding um, stretches back to, throughout the entire Mesolithic Southern Scandinavia, contrary to much of wider research, um, as previously said, but this is based on my PhD research. You can see it extends over the entire period, but unsurprisingly changes over time. Um, and importantly for this, um, presentation, the number of hordes drastically increases, um, kind of around 4,400, 4,400 BC, right when you've got contact with the Central European communities that also practice hoarding, as you'll see in a bit. And it's also at that time that the, uh, the kind of proportion of hordes that contain axes significantly increases as well compared to throughout the earlier Mesolithic. Uh, the number of hordes also increases quite significantly. I'm not sure how obvious from distrib these distribution maps it is, um, but there's around 30 late Mesolithic ones, um, but those stretch over, as you can see, on uh, more than 2,000 year period. Um, so quite rare, but they've just recently been identified, so there could be more out there. Um, when you get to just after the early Neolithic starts, um, then the number of hordes per kind of decade significantly increases, um, but, to, but still to around 30 hordes, but that's over a 200 year period. Um, and then when you get a little bit later, in the Neolithic process, then I think there's hundreds of early Neolithic hordes that are then found over a relatively short period, um, and almost always containing axes. In the Mesolithic, wide variety of different objects from the earliest Neolithic is pretty much all the hordes only contain axes. Um, so very quickly, yeah, hordes slightly increase at around 4,500 BC, and it's a huge increase, in particular around 3,800 BC um, to 3,500, 3,300 BC. Um, there's, a, yeah, there's an increased focus on axes around 4,500 BC, but yeah, after 4,000, it just dominates. It's, you might as well continue mostly a hoarding behavior, or oh, so an axe hoarding behavior. Um, and after 4,000 BC, the, um, the characteristics of the hordes generally change as well. Um, you see many of the hordes contain unused axes. Um, there seems to be a focus in some of the hordes on oversized axes up to 50 centimeters large, which I believe is the largest in Europe, um, with only comparable ones I believe found 
Um, you're about to Papua New Guinea, as, as far as my memory serves. Uh, many of the axes are also transformed prior to their deposition. Um, so they're resharpened, sometimes directly prior to their deposition. They are um, sometimes wrapped and unwrapped, it looks like, um, or in a similar form that's seen in, in Netherlands. Um, and sometimes also the axes are napped, polished, and then that polish is carefully removed. For no, there's no uh, kind of a purpose for that whatsoever. Uh, because the axes still seem, stay the same size and shape and things like that. That's some form of transformation of them. And after the early Neolithic, um, it looks like axes are primarily deposited away from sediments compared to the Mesolithic. They're often found close by to sediments. And yeah, in the Neolithic and wetlands and um, by stones dominate. And that will become important in a little bit. Um, as I mentioned before, the increase in axe hoarding around 4,400, 4,500 BC coincides exactly when you've got central Euro this context with central European Neolithic communities. And they seem to have not really any significant impact on the Mesolithic, other than, yeah, this weird exotica that seems to be exchanged up. Um, and this period also folk, um, um, coincides when um, and the axe heads uh, preferentially deposited in wetlands away from sediments compared to early in the Mesolithic. They're often found by settlements and in more dry land contexts. Um, and importantly, during the Central European Neolithic groups, um, in their kind of uh, local um, home areas, they also generally hold axes away from sediments um, and often in wetlands. Um, so it looks like some of the, um, you've got a shift in foci within the local Southern Scandinavian practice that coincide uh, with some of the, how hoarding is practiced in Central or Eastern Europe. Uh, but importantly, it's n you don't see any introductions of new ideas. It's just a shift in foci. Um, and, but there are some not notable similarities between Mesolithic and Central European community, uh, on the way hoarding is done um, in the Central European and Mesolithic communities, which they, these similarities might have been kind of these points in which they could bond over and say, okay, so what you're doing is not so different than mine, so we're happy to share ideas and perhaps participate. Wow, I'm way behind. Okay, um, good. Um, yeah, and it, so in the, around 4000 BC, then massive increase in hordes, focused on wetlands, oversized and unused objects, um, and those are. Uh, uh, all of those practices are also correlated with how jadeite axes are treated uh, within this kind of Mikkelsberg and other communities. So it seems to be, again, into uh, these, these new ideas uh, introduced into a wider uh, pre existing phenomenon. So I've only got one minute left, so I will very, very quickly. Um, ultimately, I'll just skip through that because I say in my conclusion. Pretty much. So, um, in conclusion, I think boundary objects, and I, I think hoarding may have played an important role as boundary objects because um, they were pre existing within local Mesolithic um, communities, but also within these incoming communities that were coming in. Um, the hoarding, I, but this role of the hoards as a boundary objects uh, probably changed throughout the transition. It was not uniform um, because there's different forms of interaction with, between the Central European and Mikrosburg communities. Um, so it represented, I think, firstly, a, sh a shared frame of reference uh, and point, again, in which they kind of shared uh, between the local and incoming communities. Um, I think based on the changes within some of the Scandinavian, the way Scandinavian hordes were done, um, that indicates that some sort of knowledge was shared between these different communities, um, given that the way it changed matches some of the aspects and the way the hoarding practice is done in the um, home communities. Um, and this sharing of knowledge um, led to this new hybridized form of practice. Um, Poem led to some sort of trusting relationships in new communities, not solely revolving around hoarding, but hoarding was one of the, I think, uh, uh, kind of boundary objects. And there's, these hordes don't seem to, uh, I believe they're kind of community or they involve multiple people coming together in some way. Um, and therefore, so the active participation within this hoarding practice uh, may have helped bring communities together and form new collective identities that we can see uh, elsewhere in the archaeological record. Thank you so much for listening.